Welcome back, my dears. You've come to Menopause University in the breast cancer section of our education. And I'm teaching you everything I can about breast cancer. This is video number 398, and it's on the treatment of breast cancer through the ages and stages. When I was in the contemplative phase of creating this unit, I thought long and hard about how to best address treatment for breast cancer. I read piles and piles of medical literature, and I got into the nitty-gritty of everything available to treat breast cancer in the realms of surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. And boy, are there a lot of options. But every breast cancer is different, and every woman is different and new innovative treatments crop up all the time. And as I buried myself in all the options that we currently have for treating breast cancer, I found myself wanting to know more about how we got to this point in terms of treatment. And believe me, the history of how we arrived at our current state of treatment options is a whole lot more interesting than the details of various treatment for different kinds of breast cancer that we have today. And I also realized that in a way, we've come full circle. So I decided that the best way to address breast cancer treatments in this YouTube unit is to address treatment of breast cancer through the ages and stages. I think you'll find it fascinating. And I think you'll see that history really does repeat itself. Or maybe you could say that sometimes the end and the beginning are the same place. This particular topic is not in my book. You'll need to watch this video if you want to know about the history of treatment for breast cancer. I'll start by saying that Breast cancer has been around for a very long time. Way back in the 1880s, a surgeon by the name of William Halstead started focusing on treatment for breast cancer. He was perplexed by how women developed local recurrence of the cancer after excision of the primary tumor. And the recurrence typically occurred around the margins of the tissue that had been extracted. So Dr. Halstead decided that if the margins were the problem, then the solution was to extend the margins. In other words, why not remove a large margin of normal tissue around the tumor as well as the tumor itself? And he called this procedure a radical mastectomy. So we're going to build our wheel and start with a radical mastectomy, because this is where it all began. Radical mastectomy involved removal of the breast itself, the underlying chest muscle, the overlying skin, and the lymph nodes in the armpit. Halstead witnessed great success from his radical mastectomy with a 40% five-year survival rate. This was twice the survival rate of untreated patients. But post-operatively, the complication rate was very high. Now, surgeons love to perform surgery. I know, because I am a surgeon. <laughs> There's just something magical about being able to cure something by cutting it out. But that can go too far. And that was precisely the case for the radical mastectomy. Nevertheless, Halstead's radical mastectomy remained the standard treatment for breast cancer for decades. And after Halstead died, others took his place promoting the radical mastectomy. They even took it farther than he had. By 1956, the radical mastectomy had edged its way into the realm of the soup radical mastectomy. And then, even into the realm of the ultra-radical mastectomy. These 
procedures left women terribly disfigured. Some of them involved removal of the breast itself, the underlying chest muscles, the overlying skin, the lymph nodes in the armpit and the chest, the ribs, part of the sternum, and the shoulder bone. Surgeons got to the point of believing that the more they cut, the more they cured. But in 1924, a surgeon named Jeffrey Keynes decided to forego performing a radical mastectomy on one of his frail breast cancer patients. And instead, he implanted some radium in her breast. And what do you know? She improved significantly. So this induced him to try other similar strategies, including combinations of surgery and radiation therapy. But his actual surgical procedures were much less radical. Instead of performing the deforming, radical, super radical, and ultra radical mastectomy, he merely excised the visible tumor and then treated the patient with radiation therapy. Now, as is typical, when anyone does anything new or different in medicine or in life, <laughs> his colleagues teased him. In this instance, they did so by calling his procedure a lumpectomy. It was meant to be demeaning. So then we had the lumpectomy. Lumpectomy with radiation therapy comes next. And other surgeons refused to perform lumpectomies even though Keynes saw great success with his combination of lumpectomy combined with radiation therapy. In 1948, two surgeons in London modified the radical mastectomy and performed what is called, go figure, <laughs> a modified radical mastectomy. <laughs> modified radical mastectomy. It was a radical mastectomy with sparing of the underlying muscles. So for a time, both the radical mastectomy and the modified radical mastectomy were the standards of care for breast cancer. In 1953, a young surgeon named George Barney Cryle started to follow in Keene's footsteps. He recognized flaws in the logic of surgeons who performed radical, super radical, and ultra radical mastectomies. The way he saw it, either the tumor was localized, in which case it would be cured by removing all of it, or it had already spread, in which case removing more tissue would not improve the situation. So Cryle completely rejected all radical procedures and invented his own less aggressive procedure, which he called a simple mastectomy. He had excellent success rates with it, and he found no difference in survival between women treating, treated with simple mastectomy versus those treated with radical mastectomy. From 1971 to 1981, the first study comparing these treatments for breast cancer was carried out. It showed that the rates of breast cancer metastasis, recurrence, and death were no different between women who had radical mastectomy, simple mastectomy, or lumpectomy with radiation therapy. So after 100 years of performing deforming radical mastectomies on women, it was proven that such procedures were excessive. In the mid-1960s, surgeons still dominated the field of breast cancer. And then along came an oncologist named Paul Carbone, who decided to see if chemotherapy could be used alongside surgery for breast cancer treatment. He thought of it as helping to cleanse the body of any residual breast cancer. So he called it adjuvant, which means to help. It was adjuvant chemotherapy. It 
It was like a surgeon's little helper used to eradicate any leftover microscopic cancer cells after surgery. But you know, <laughs> doctors are like children in some ways. <laughs> the surgeons didn't want any help from anyone, let alone an oncologist offering chemotherapy. Eventually, some oncologists teamed up and got funding from the National Cancer Institute to conduct a trial on chemotherapy following surgery for early stage breast cancer. But they had to go to Italy to do it because of the closed mindedness of Americans on the subject. <laughs> and surgeons were not just skeptical, they were hostile. But in 1977, it was shown that surgery followed by tamoxifen decreased recurrence of breast cancer by 50%. And that really excited the oncologists. But you know how it is. People tend to think that more is better. So when the use of one chemotherapeutic agent did not produce impressive enough results, oncologists decided to maximize the impact by combining drugs. I call it combo chemo or combination chemotherapy. Some people call it a cocktail, or maybe we should call it an arsenal. That's the next step on our cycle here. Oncologists began combining two, three, four chemotherapeutic agents to target cancer cells every which way. And that led to combinations of not only surgery plus radiation therapy or surgery plus chemotherapy, which is this, but also to combinations of all three and combination chemotherapy. So here we had surgery plus radiation therapy plus combination chemotherapy. And guess what? This is where we are today. Currently, it is the standard of care for most women with any kind of breast cancer to have surgery, followed by radiation therapy, along with combination chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And this is happening even to women who have had only pre-cancer. I find this shocking, and I wonder which is worse, the radical mastectomies of yesteryear or the radical surgery plus radiation therapy plus combination chemotherapy of the current year. <clears throat> Could it be that we've just come full circle by replacing excessive cutting with less cutting and excessive radiating and poisoning? Is it possible that the end and the beginning are the same place? If you want to read more about the history of cancer, here are two fantastic books. This one is The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And this is The Secret History of the War on Cancer by Deborah Davis. I think you would find them both fascinating. They tell you a whole lot about the history of breast cancer treatments. In video number 388, I taught you about the grading and staging of breast cancer. You might remember this chart of the stages based on the extent of spread of the cancer. So now that you know a bit about the various treatments for breast cancer, let's add treatment to this chart. You saw me do this very same thing in the units on endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer. All I've done here is add a column for treatment to the right side of the previous chart. It's in green and yellow colors. And I've indicated that for stages zero through three, the treatment is the same. Lumpectomy versus simple mastectomy, plus radiation therapy, plus 
combination chemotherapy or immunotherapy. But don't you find it odd that the treatment is the same for stage zero, which is not even cancer, as it is for stage three? Doesn't that seem excessive? Isn't it a lot like the radical mastectomies, super radical mastectomies, and ultra radical mastectomies of yesteryear? How can it be that pre-breast cancer and invasive breast cancer are treated in exactly the same way? In the unit on cervical cancer, you discovered that cervical pre-cancer is treated with very simple and minimal treatments, even though the treatments for actual cervical cancer are radical. Here's the treatment chart we created in that unit. Here you see that cervical precancer is treated with either cryotherapy, laser, conization, or LEAP. All of these are simple office or outpatient procedures. And women who have treatment for cervical precancer by any of these means go on their merry way afterward. They never give it another thought. It's one and done treatment. That's not the case with stage zero pre-cancer of the breast, not by a long shot. Women with breast pre-cancer endure all this excessive treatment and more. Even after their treatment, cure, and 100% survival rates, they carry the stigma of breast cancer with them forever, even though they never even had breast cancer. I don't see how it's any different than the deformities and disfigurement of the radical mastectomies of Dr. Halstead's day. Maybe the end and the beginning are the same place. And not only that, these women are denied all sorts of options for managing their menopause, even though they only had pre cancer, even though it's cured, and even though there's no reason to deny them anything. It's as if they wear the fuchsia letter B on their chests for the rest of their lives. It's as if they're outcasts. And the sad thing is that the options that they are denied are often things that could greatly improve their quality of life. But instead of being able to take advantage of them, the misconceptions and overkill of breast cancer robs them of their quality of life. This is an unfair trade. They trade a 100% cure rate of a disease they never even had for a poor quality of life that lasts for the entire rest of their lives. Take another look at the chart of treatments for cervical cancer and cervical precancer. Notice that one of the treatments for cervical precancer is cryotherapy. I've made it bold and red this time. Why isn't that an option for treatment of breast precancer or even breast cancer? Cryotherapy happens to be a primary treatment option for a variety of cancers, including bone cancer, eye cancer, kidney cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, skin cancer, and prostate cancer. In Europe, cryotherapy is also a common treatment for breast cancer. Why isn't it available everywhere? All the data show that breast cryotherapy is very effective and successful in treating early breast cancer in addition to breast precancer. And like cryotherapy used for cervical precancer, it's fast, taking only 20 to 40 minutes. It's painless and it's non-scarring. There are no significant side effects or complications. Cryotherapy is quite commonly used to treat prostate cancer. And heck, 
it's a whole lot easier to access a breast than it is to access a prostate gland. Besides, there are no vital structures in the breast, but there are many in and near the prostate gland. So why in the world isn't breast cryotherapy a treatment option for early breast cancer and precancer? It just doesn't make sense. When I think about all the participants in the management of breast cancer, it makes me wonder if there's an effort to make sure every professional gets to play a part. Which doctors participate in breast cancer treatment? Your gynecologic oncologist, your gynecologist, your breast surgeon, your radiologist, your pathologist, and your oncologist. And it seems like every professional has a different kind of treatment to offer, so they just do them all. Of course, there's plenty of controversy between these professionals as to whose treatment is better. It's somewhat like the hammer and nail phenomenon. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the surgeons think all breast cancers need surgery. The radiologists think all breast cancers need radiation therapy. The oncologists think all breast cancers need chemotherapy. So each one just hammers away at your breasts. Of course, this leads to a whole lot of over-treatment. And in the world of breast cancer, more than any other entity in medicine, over-treatment is the rule rather than the exception. But I think this overzealous approach has unfortunate consequences. For instance, over-treatment of a primary breast, can breast cancer can limit your treatment options if you have a recurrence. So maybe we really have come full circle from radical to irrational with the best cancer treatments through the ages and stages. Give us some thought. There's something to it, right? In any case, I hope you enjoyed learning about how we ended up with the treatments we have for breast cancer today, and I hope you see how unsatisfactory the current treatments are. They do work, but their cost and consequences are a big trade-off. The chart of breast cancer treatment by stage is available at menopausetaylor.me and in the description box below the screen. It's your summary. Next week, I'll teach you about breast cancer prognosis. You know where to find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Stories. You know how to subscribe to this channel in my newsletter. And you know that you can go to menopausetaylor.me anytime to schedule a consultation. See you next week week. <laughs> Bye! <laughs>